Thank you for joining us today as we discuss how we can achieve gender equality um, in the workplace. With me are two very formidable women with a track record of success in numerous campaigns and as advocates for women and for social inclusion. So welcome to Orla O'Connor and Orla is a director of the National Women's Council, which is the leading national women's membership organization in Ireland. And Orla was recognized as one of the top most influential people by Time Magazine in 2019 for her role in the Together for Yes campaign, which is widely known. Orla has led numerous high level successful campaigns on a wide range of issues on women's rights, including social welfare reform, something close to my heart, pension reform, and for the introduction of quality and affordable uh, childcare. So also with us today is Senator Alice Mary Higgins. And uh, Senator Higgins has served as a Senator for the National University of Ireland since April 2016. She is a leader of civil engagement group in the 25th uh, Shannon. Alice Mary is a proven legislator and a track record second to none as an advocate for equality international development and social inclusion. inclusion. So very uh, impressive individuals and I'm so delighted they're able to join us here today. So you're both welcome and I look forward to discussing the issues around gender equality and how companies, wider society and legislators can address the age old issue um, of gender equality. So I think what I'd like to discuss today um, is what the term gender equality actually means and what the barriers that are facing women in the workplace today and the importance of the recommendations for the, from the Citizens' Assembly, which I know you're familiar with, if gender coders, coders actually work. Um, and talk a bit about um, the, the recent introduction to the Doyle of the Gender Pay Information Bill, which is a, a hot topic. And so there's plenty to discuss today. I'm sure there are plenty of questions and plenty of answers um, uh, from, from both of you. So if I, if I can start off by saying, um, you know, what do we actually mean by gender equality? And that question goes to you, Orla, because I think it needs uh, some, inf some kind of explanation. So what does gender equality in the workplace actually look like? And, you know, what do you think the barriers to achieving it is? Is it all about pay? Well, I, I think it means many things. And just first of all, to say thank you, Sharon, for, you know, for hosts, for organising this webinar. And it's great to be uh, joining Senator Alice Mary Higgins as well, um, because I think this is a really good moment to be talking about gender equality in, in the workplace. Um, and particularly, I think, because as we're, although we're still in the COVID, the pandemic period, but, but the experience of COVID, I think, has brought a whole new discussion on what gender equality in the workplace means. And it's raised, I think, it's put a spotlight on so many of the inequalities that were there for women. And I think women have, you know, a very different view about what gender equality should look like coming out of this. Um, so, so I suppose, you know, for me and for the Women's Council, it, it, it's about it's about equal participation, but it's also about equal outcomes in terms of the outcomes for women from from paid work. So, you know, so, yes, what does it mean in terms of pay? But what does it mean also in terms of quality of life, in terms of how you're you know, how you combine um, both, you know, paid work with all of the other aspects of your work, of your life? Um, and, and I think that's why the COVID piece is, is so important in this, because certainly what women have been saying to us and what the members, members of the Women's Council, but, you know, over the past, you know, year and a half, women are absolutely, you know, saying very clearly that, you know, they're still the main carers, that while they're in paid work, they're also, you know, they have two complete jobs, full time jobs in terms of doing all of the care within families and really being. And I think that's what COVID showed is that it's it's not always about you know doing the care but it's the whole responsibility for care within families care for for other family members care for children and how that gets combined with paid work and that's hugely challenging and that our model of work doesn't allow for that. And similarly, our model of work doesn't allow for participation in so many other aspects of life. So, you, you know, it, it's it's made so difficult to be able to make choices. Um, and I, I think very, very central, and again, I th think this is an issue that's come up in COVID, is in terms of 
women, produ- you know, women being very much the, the majority uh, worker in low paid jobs, in part time work, in precarious work. And, and, and really, you know, the, the fact that that has been so compounded, it's been compounded in terms of, you know, we see really high numbers now of women who are unemployed, particularly young women. Um, the sectors that women worked in, those low paid precarious sectors were, were sectors that have, have really got compressed. Um, so it makes the, the decisions that women are making as we're coming out of COVID now, I think, much more difficult. So we're getting a lot of women, for example, contacting us saying, do you know, I don't know if I will go back to work. If I go back to paid work, sorry, because they are working, if they go back to paid work because they're weighing up a low paid, you know, a low paid salary with having to pay childcare and feeling exhausted from the whole experience of COVID. And I think that's a real issue. And similarly, women who've had children thinking of is it, is it worth returning? In, in, into, into that type of employment. And then there's the whole layer when we're talking about the, the gender pay gap of then when women also return, they're, they're returning at, at a much lower level. So their prospects in terms of promotion is, you know, ha, has really decreased. And that's why we see much fewer numbers of women at, at senior level. Um, and that in itself becomes a sort of a factor. It, you know, it's the, you know, you, you can't beat what you can't see you know, idea that, you know, if women aren't seeing other women in senior roles, then that's also a discouraging piece. So there are a number of, you know, there are a number of really important factors, I think, in terms of, you know, when we look at gender equality in in the workplace, but I think the conversation has got a lot more heightened now and, and has become a lot more critical in terms of how we try and solve it. So there's been, there's been some kind of positivity out of COVID because it's become much more visible mm. and a much more, um, mainstream and I and I think I think it has become that way in society and, and because it, it primarily is a societal issue um, but I think it, it, it translates in into the workplace I agree with that if I could go um, to you Alice Mary is there gender equality in your workplace um, or do you think it'll ever be achieved my place of course you know in the Oireachtas it's been as an elected representative and that aspect the workplace there in the Oireachtas also has a wide range of other workers so for example in terms of when you look at gender equality in the workplace in the Oireachtas uh, it's not just issues around gender equality in public representatives that's clearly not there but there's a lot of other workplace inequality issues too if we look at how the secretarial assistants for example within the Oireachtas are paid much less than living wage you know like many other institutions public institutions and public public bodies that really should be leading in terms of good work practice, we've seen more temporary contracts being used uh, for different parts. We've seen more outsourcing of services and contract work. So a lot of the issues we see across the economy and across uh, different sectors in terms of workplace equality, they're there in the Oireachtas as an institution and as a workplace as well. And I kind of wanted to begin with that because I remember back when in the past life I worked for the National Women's Council and I was working a lot around very precarious sectors. So, you know, looking at um, uh, areas like retail and and hospitality and that. Uh, And my colleague right beside me was working on women in leadership. And something that we always tried to do was to join the dots. So when you think about a workplace, it's we always call it almost like from the boardroom to the to the shop floor, you know, that you you need to think about everybody in that workplace and what equality looks like there. And I think that's important. But of course, in my workplace, there is a huge issue with inequality in terms of the political representatives. We do not have anything like the equality we need in terms of women in politics. The Shannad is now kind of at about a third, which they say is a tipping point where culture begins to shift. Uh, the Iraq, this, uh, the Dole only has moved really to 22% or 23%, having been at 16%, you know, wildly for years. Uh, and I do think that gender quotas played a really positive role in forcing political parties to put forward candidates. And we know that when women uh, when women are put forward, they often do really, really well in elections. Um, so yes, there's a lot to be done there. What I do think though is, is, and it's interesting, and I'm sure every sector has its version of this, we have taken the step forward in terms of uh, more women, you know, in the all, in the, in the Shannad, now we're hitting the obstacles around the culture, around the practices, because a lot of how these institutions work has been designed 
you know, on the assumption of somebody who has an invisible other person at home who's helping them manage everything uh, where there's no family responsibilities. I mean, as an example of how far we have to go, there was a debate on the family friendly Arachthas, which took place at 11 p.m. last night in the Dáil. And uh, that gives you a sense of, you know, the distance we have to travel in terms of planning the work of the Arachthas in a way that, you know, everybody who cares about family life and can engage. And I think, and also then looking at the kind of invisible barriers and some of the kind of subtle ways by, for example, depriving women of certain opportunities uh, within parties or not giving them the same resources that a, a male candidate might be given. You know, we definitely saw when so many women came in and were so strong in the last Oireachtas, it was really disappointing to me and a real concern that a lot of women from lots of different parties were not returned. And I don't know that all of them got the support they should have got from their parties around staying in politics. And, you know, councillors, it's a really good progression we've seen now um, where councillors are going to be getting something closer to proper pay for the work that they do. But I do think we need to have um, gender quotas in terms of local elections too. Um, and we also do need um, to look at measures like that weird gap everybody's been talking about, the fact that there isn't any maternity leave provision. Um, that is a real gap in terms of the Oireachtas. So there's a lot that we need to fix. And the reason that it matters, particularly in my workplace, it's not that, you know, is that our workplace are making decisions that affect everybody else. And I think of, you know, you know, you're obviously the financial services union. So, you know, you'll be familiar with that dynamic of decision making and how it happens and the inequality in decision making. But, and, you know, thinking about back to what Christina Lagarde said um, back you know, during the time of the crash, I think it was that, you know, greater diversity sharpens thinking. It reduces the potential for groupthink and that basically greater diversity leads to more prudence and it limits reckless decision making, the kind of reckless decision making that provoked the last financial crisis. And I think that's so important. It's, again, an example of how it's not just that women need opportunities to be in politics, but politics needs more women to be there in order to tackle that kind of room thing. And it's, it's something that the research has always shown everywhere is when you have greater diversity in the room, it's not just that you get different perspectives, but everybody comes a little bit more prepared to meetings because people don't go in with assumptions. They go in knowing they have to explain their assumptions and they have to persuade. So you actually get a level up from everybody. So basically I would say we have a distance to travel in politics. We have a huge responsibility to speed up that progress in politics because it affects everybody else. And we also, um, I feel, even though there's obstacles there, I think there is a huge momentum and there's a public demand to have uh, an Iraq that looks like them. And I, maybe just a last point to add on that. I think the diversity of women that we need to see as well. Uh, you know, I'm really glad within our group, we have Eileen Flynn, who's you know, the first traveler, a uh, woman to be in the Iraq that she's part of my civil engagement group at the moment, but she's one step forward, but we need to basically make sure that we have a huge diversity of women um, across it. And, and, you know, that's probably enough about the Iraq this, and I know we need to talk about other sectors. And I just would add to what Orla said. I really think this is a key moment now. And it's very important that we do take an ambition level. And I've just talked about my workplace, but I think interrogation of each sector is really important right now so that we're identifying the patterns, some of which will be the unique obstacles within each sector and many of which are the same kinds of obstacles and the same problems in terms of gender equality uh, that we're seeing taking different forms, whether you're an, you know, an actor, whether you're an accountant, whether you're working in a hotel, whether you're in the Iraq, does some of those same issues come up uh, in different ways again and again? I think that's right. I think it's, it's fairly similar uh, across the board. Um, I, I think, you know, to achieve where we want to go with all of this because, it, it, you know, COVID and other things have had an influence on it. I think there needs to be deliberate interventions and if it's legislation or it's yeah. quotas or it's, um, you know, boardroom reports or, or whatever it is, um, there, there needs to be a lot of thinking around that, and, you know, in terms of how it can be demonstrated that is that it's progressing. Um, and just... Just to agree with you very briefly, I think I really agree that legislation and real measures are what actually drives change because um, voluntary codes are fine, but they really only get you so far. And that's why, you know, I think that's where we have a responsibility as legislators. But 
it's it's interesting even in terms of the board's issue and I'll leave that now but it was only when there was the threat of a European directive on 40% women on boards that suddenly we saw some measures to bring women forward on board so I think it's a it's a reminder that we really do need those strong measures. I mean, just moving that discussion on, I, I don't think that we can have a discussion on gender equality in the workplace without referring to the recent recommendations from the Citizens Assembly, uh, for example, and the Assembly has agreed and recommended 45 points. And um, I really wanted to get a view from both of you on the importance of those recommendations from the Assembly and, you know, were you surprised and, you know, what should happen next? And if I go back to you, Orla, I recently heard you say on the radio that every woman in Ireland is tired of waiting for change. And, and that really rung true, I think, um, uh, for, for, for women. And do you think the Assembly recommendations actually go far enough? And and what do you think and um, should happen next? And, and particularly... What should happen next? What should happen next in terms of the, the constitution and any changes? I think the Citizens Assembly recommendations were groundbreaking, are groundbreaking, because they really did. I, I think they went far. And but particularly, I think their emphasis on um, public services and the need for public services for, you know, to address the inequalities that women experience. You know, one of the things that's important about this Citizens Assembly, you know, in comparison to to some of the recent ones is this is probably the first where they've really got to say something about economic issues. And they gave a very clear direction in terms of economic issues around public services, public investment. And also they gave a really strong statement in terms of saying that, you know, and yes, society needs to pay for them through, you know, through redistribution, through taxation. Um, so I think they were really important messages uh, and really strong. And then within the actual recommendations, I think absolutely on the constitution, I think it's really significant with the fact that they took a very sort of broad um, you know, they, they recommended that the constitution should have a broad understanding of care to really recognise the value of care for the common good. Um, also, they went further than because originally, you know, the assembly was predominantly to look at that article 41.2, which relates to, you know, what's considered as women's place within the home. But they went beyond that and said that the whole article needs to be changed because it, it, we need to move away from a definition of um of the family based on marriage. And they also recommended a whole sort of anti-discrimination clause within our constitution, which, which I think is very strong. So, you know, I think once again, we really do see, you know, when, when there's those moments where citizens can have the time to discuss, to deliberate the issues, when they're given, you know, a, a huge amount of information actually, um, and also, I think it's enormous, like it's, it's quite astounding, really, that all of this took place online, um, because we know how difficult it is in terms of these sorts of conversations that are deep conversations, but to be having this online and to have come forward with, with the recommendations that they did. And, you know, I, I think it was interesting as well that in the announcement of the voting, Catherine Day, who's the chairperson, um, when she repeatedly on radio, she was being said, oh, but sure, you know, you know really, do the citizens really think? this um, and you know she repeatedly cited uh, you know very clearly that when you look at the votes on marriage equality on abortion actually the citizens were very accurate and what was reflected in the citizens assembly was reflected in those votes so you know I mean I know you've asked me particularly on, on the constitution but beyond that in terms of the economic areas around child care around flexible working around the recognition of care all of the recommendations and and one which I have to say that in the Women's Council we were so pleased to see uh, was also a universal pension because there's such a critical this is a really critical time for the future yeah. of pensions and the fact that the Pensions Commission is meeting and really universal pension doesn't seem to be on their agenda but it's absolutely on the people's agenda and it'll be on the election agenda very much from from what we can see in the citizens assembly so so i think the government has a very clear roadmap for what it needs to do for gender equality from the citizens assembly hey alice i'd be interested to hear your your view Sorry, i think it was such a strong mandate like the message is so clear and and the fact that so many of these decisions were made i mean even in contrast to other citizens assemblies they were made by 80% and 90%, you know, really strong, strong message. And uh, from the kind of top down 
I think that fundamental point that they talk about the state's basically obligation to recognize uh, uh, and, and have a responsibility in terms of care, making care be clearly a collective responsibility for the state. That message is really important. And again, this is something during COVID, it's, you know, both in one way a positive, another way a difficult, but because we know that women have suffered disadvantage in many cases because they've taken on caring work and had to manage caring work during COVID and that many of women have individually, uh, you know, we, we've seen that in, in many sectors where they've been carrying that work when some of the social structures we have for care were gone. But it's also made care really visible, the level to which all of our working systems rely on care, how it's that invisible support structure. And what's really significant is the state, the idea that the state should in the constitution acknowledge kind of a collective responsibility in relation to that. I think that's one of the most kind of empowering and significant things. And I think it would send, uh, it, you know, when we talk about economics, something, you know, we've always argued for is, is making care visible in our budget systems and that it's kind of left as a vocation and kind of an add-on thing, but care should be a quality area of work for those who are working in care. Care should be recognized and rewarded and reflected in our social protection system for those giving care in that way. And care should be something that should be accommodated in the design of workplaces and working systems. And I think that idea of it, this thing, this kind of invisible support becoming visible and becoming a collective responsibility could be really transformative. And I think that's really important now when we look to the changes coming in and other areas. And I know we'll probably discuss some things like remote working and others. It's really important that we, we don't basically uh, sideline those delivering care, that we don't push it back into being an invisible support again, but that we continue that. And I think the, the, the request for public childcare is a really strong, like childcare almost as national infrastructure, something that we need. That was really strong. And the other economic pieces I think there's, this is what I, you know, it, it recognized power in a really meaningful way, these recommendations, economic power. And it recognizes, uh, I like that it pushes for a living wage by 2025. And it recognizing that economic justice issue of a living wage is actually a feminist issue. It's a gender equality issue because we know that women are more likely to be on those very low wages. So a living wage isn't just, you know, a social equality issue. It's a gender equality issue. And that's something really strong. And the other thing that I thought is really important is that incredibly strong message on the importance of a, a right to collective bargaining. And what I like about that, uh, if, if they want to shift the responsibilities in the, in the constitution, it's a look to make sure that we, we put power uh, you know, in, into workers and into unions across the country. And I think collective bargaining as a right, recognizing that actually um, equality isn't just something that's granted from above, but that a lot of the time equality is something that's going to be won from, from the ground up and trying to strengthen the hand of those who will identify the next, the next step forward for equality, maybe beyond what's in the Citizens' Assembly. And I, I always use the example of the Women's Workers' Union who were the first to win two weeks paid holiday for everybody. And it may well be that the next step forward in equality isn't in these recommendations, but it comes from unions who are uh, women workers there. And that's why I think that collective bargaining piece is certainly something I'll be pursuing and pushing for them to follow through on. And I would just note with that online piece, I think it's particularly important now because we may have a much more physically diverse, uh, not physically diverse, uh, physically scattered uh, workplace. We may have a lot more people working remotely. And I think, that's why a right to collective bargaining is going to be really important so that unions can actually meet and, and help to, to, to organize workers who may be in a number of different physical locations. So anyway, those are some of the things that I'm excited about. I'm, I think we're uh, equally enthusiastic about the Citizens' Assembly's recommendations. Yeah. I mean, it paints a picture of, uh, of an actually equal Ireland. Thanks for that. And of course, collective bargaining is something, you know, very close to our hearts here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and in terms of in terms of the paper that we're going to publish uh, in a, a couple of weeks' time, it's certainly one of our, our key demands in terms of how we see um, we can close the, the, the gender pay gap. Um, but back to yourself, Orla, just on that question of what should happen next, have you any thoughts in terms of where we 
you know, where we, we take the, the Citizens' Assembly recommendations. I mean, I, I really, um, I, I like where Alice was going in terms of this needs to come forward and legislation but needs to go through the union's collective bargaining because that seems to be the right place for it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the breadth of the recommendations means different things need to be happen. happen. So, you know, um, in relation to the constitutional ones, we would like to see them taken, you know, taken together and that we would like to see a referendum in 2022 on those, um, on those constitutional recommendations. And that's going to be really important. And then in terms of, of all of the others, because um, I think there's 45 in total recommendations. So, you know, we, there's another over 40 to, to be dealt with. And, you know, I think it, it will be really important that they don't just sort of get lost um, between various Arachthus committees. Um, so it is going to be important that, <coughs> excuse me, that there's a central sort of, whether it's a special Arachthus committee to deal with all of the recommendations in the assembly to ensure that they get implemented in their different ways. And, and Alice Mary is so right. I mean, obviously the, the trade unions have, have a key role in terms of ensuring some of those are implemented and, and making sure they're implemented implemented in, in a way that um, in a way that workers want them to be. Um, so, so there's a critical piece in there. But clearly, I mean, there are some of them that are very pertinent because the, go the government is making decisions right now in, in relation to things. And that's why I think, um, you know, when Alice, Mary, when Alice Mary, when you were talking about the collective bargaining one, that's absolutely crucial in terms of so many of the issues that are facing women workers and low paid workers at the moment. So it's really important that 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 one, you know, gets gets pulled up because it has a huge influence in terms of, you know, so many other pieces, I think, within the, within the recommendations. And obviously, you know, we know, for example, that the Department of Children and Equality um, are making decisions with regard to childcare right now. So it's really important that they, they take those um, recommendations on a public childcare model. And, si and similarly, as I've said, the, the Commission on Pensions. So I think there's some that, that because the government is making decisions you know, in the course of this year, that it is really important that they pay attention to those and that they take those into account. And then I think overall, there needs to be an overall um, sort of body and whether that's a special Rockless committee who, ha who has that oversight of ensuring that they're, they're recommended. I mean, um, it was really powerful, I think, in the reporting of the voting. The citizens wrote a letter to the Oireachtas that they then put said in a, in a video. And and one of the things that comes very clearly from it is that you know they do not want to see all their work and all their time and all their commitment just be left um, and, and and for nothing to happen with these because that would be the worst thing that could happen. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, for, for our side in the Women's Council, it's going to be about campaigning really strongly to make sure that they're implemented, but also in joining up, I think, with the trade union movement, to, you know, to, because we need to build momentum behind these, because we know that, that there is the danger that these recommendations, particularly ones that wouldn't be within the government's programme, will get left. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. That probably leads me on uh, nicely just to sharing two slides um, with you. And um, the first one really uh, talks to that paper that I just referred to earlier on in terms of what we see um, that our, our demands to close the, the gender pay gap. I think it's very important um, from our perspective that you know, we make pay ranges public for workers to see and end the pay secrecy. And I think you know, we've all um, experienced that or certainly have seen that in, in organisations and it's just simply not uh, good enough any anymore. We want to make employers publish the annual gender pay gap and some of them have, but, you know, we believe it's much more than just a tick box exercise. There needs to be those quotas and there needs to be that accountability there uh, in terms of where that's going. And it's really important and it's back, I think, to talking about a lot of women are in part-time and flexible working arrangements with employers. So it's really important that that can continue and that that is encouraged and it's not seen as uh, entry into low level pay. Um, and I think we need to, you know, we're asking for an audit of pay increases and performance rating each year for fairness and for equality. So a full transparency uh, on some of those processes. And, you know, um, we touched on it um, earlier on. Uh, Alice Mary talked about it, ensure that collective bargaining uh, is a right for all workers. And that is actually enshrined in our, con our constitution. So we, we feel that that is, is, is part of that. 
And really a few points to note, you know, from our perspective in terms of statistics, if we can move on to the next slide. In 2018 in financial services, there was almost a 26,000 euro gap in the, the earnings between males and females. And you know, it's a huge, huge figure um, when you get right on, on underneath it and you lift the bonnet. And, you, you know, without direct action, that, that gap in the EU will not, um, you know, it'll not change until 2104, which is a number that I can hardly get uh, my mouth around because it just seems so distant in, into the future. And without direct action, um, the pay gap will not close in Ireland until uh, 2050. And, and it was interesting that, that this is the gender pay gap now is the number one issue back on a survey from our membership. 70% of whom uh, are female. Um, so that was just, that was, it was an interesting exercise for us to do. And, you know, certainly we'll be campaigning now on it because we think it's the way to go. And, and I do like the idea of getting together with other unions and like-minded bodies and, and really raising the voice on, on this because I think there is certainly a collective understanding and a collective agenda because half the workforce are women, um, and, but, you know, they all, the vast majority of them have another job as well outside of the office or the factory or the shop or, or wherever it is um, they, they happen to work. If I go to Alice Mary, I wanted to ask you about the, the gender pay information bill. We talked about legislation earlier on. Do you think, Alice Mary, that it goes far enough? Well, it's interesting because I, I was just looking at the, you know, the points that you're pushing forward. And there's one or two of them that I think identify maybe areas that could be even strengthened in that in that legislation. So the legislation is a really good step forward. Um, I think, um, you know, and it looks, I know that there are proposals to address some of the concerns around kind of accountability and implementing, you know, that it's likely to get amended, you know, further when it goes along. Um, it, the legislation kind of provides for a snapshot of pay equality at different levels. One of the, you know, it kind of, you know, it, it's it's almost talking about um, you know, the pay of a part-time man at a certain level, the pay of a woman who's working part-time, you know, in another level. And that a concern I have, though, sometimes is when you have a snapshot, you don't always capture that sense of the journey or the progression. And I know that that's something, you know, in your point, when you talked about the pay increases and the performance ratings, you know, those questions of, what gets valued in performance reviews and what doesn't get valued? You know, what are the, the you know, the, wrong, the invisible rungs in terms of progress? That issue around, say, when you part-time and flexible working, th this is a real concern. And I know that this is a concern, you know, remote working should be a brilliant opportunity for people, but there is a concern, a realistic concern, you know, that people don't want that the signal of that you're doing remote working, that you're doing part-time working signals that you're somehow not interested in climbing the ladder. And that's why I really like in your provisions that you mentioned that point about part-time and flexible working at all levels. And that needs to include senior levels all the way up the line. It needs to be not something that, you know, signals, you know, you're getting parked at a certain level. So that element of progression, I think could be strengthened a little bit in the bill. Um, uh, it, they do talk about it in one or two areas, but, it could be looked at a little bit more. And something that maybe the Athena Swan system has done in academia really well is almost capture the levels of, are people moving up the ranks? You know, how many people do you have at different levels? And there's only one or two levels whereby um, they, they measure the percentage. And I think it's one place they do it, which is really good. The percentage of women on a certain kind of contract, the percentage of men on a certain kind of contract. They do that in terms of temporary contracts, which is good but I think they should be doing it in terms of part-time contracts. They should be doing it in that area as well. And I'm also conscious of if temporary contracts is the vulnerable end at the other end where, you know, you might be talking about a special assignees and, you know, these kind of Uber categories of employee that you sometimes get within the financial services. And I don't know if some of them might slip through um, because it's an issue I'm concerned about more generally is the shift towards um, payment in dividends or payment in shares versus uh, income. And that's, the bill talks about bonuses and benefits in kind, but I'm concerned that some of that payment in shares element might not get captured by the bill. So there's a few little areas, but these are really areas that can be fixed. And one thing it does do that's really good is it does, this is maybe one of the places where we 
could begin to track uh, progress is it talks about how many within an organization are in the top quarter of income, the middle quarter of income, you know, the bottom quarter of income and so forth. And I think that's something that could be, could, more could be done with, you know. So those are some of the areas, but these, I think it's going to be a really important piece. But just to add on what Orla was saying about the Pension Commission, just to give an idea of how important that is, um, the pension gap is 35%. So, you know, if we talk about a, a pay gap of about 14%, the pension gap is more than double that. And that's something that also really needs to be addressed. So uh, that's something maybe we can look to as well. Uh, and I think that involves not just um, an individual overhaul of organizations, but around uh, how we approach pensions as a whole, that universal pension idea. Maybe the last thing I would just say, something, the bill will be good, but what we do with the information that comes out of the bill is going to be also really important because it shouldn't just be seen as a company by company health check, but it should be seen as a sector by sector health check. So for example, if we notice a pattern in the insurance industry, uh, we notice a pattern in, you know, another area of, of, of uh, you know, in terms of other areas of pay. If particular sectors are having particular patterns, then that might require the kind of sectoral interventions that we've had um, quite effectively through things like the Joint Labour Committees in the past um, in terms of areas like um, uh, hospitality. And, and in conclusion, that's a question for both of you. And I know that there isn't one silver bullet here that is going to solve the issue of gender equality. But if there was one thing that you would like seeing done, um, either from a legislative perspective or a society perspective, what would it be and, and what effect would that have? And Orla, I'm, I'm going to go to you. Sorry, it's a catch-all question. I never find it easy saying pick one thing because... yeah. Um, like it's always a sort of a jigsaw. It's a it's a multiple piece that, that needs to be done. Um, so I'm going to go to. <laughs> so I think yeah, for, for me, implementing the legislation on the right to collective bargaining would immediately I think have an impact in terms of um, low paid women's conditions, um, and and that would be I think really important. Um, I also think the second thing has to be about the public care infrastructure, because my concern is that things like remote working, like flexible working in under the current circumstances of an absence of, of a, a, a support infrastructure for care may mean that, that it's, it's women going back and, and filling all those care gaps. Um, and filling them even more now because grandparents are much sort of less in the picture than they were before, which wasn't good and wasn't right. But, but we know from women, are, 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 it has meant that they have taken on much more of that responsibility. So I, I think there's two things. We need that public infrastructure of care. And if the right to collective bargaining was done, and if that was done in the short term, that would help us on the road to some of the other things. But yeah, for me, it, it, it's a... It's the jigsaw of pieces that have to be put together and, and the things that, you know, both of us have spoken about this evening. And for you, Alice Mary? Collective bargaining and childcare, like Orla said, but also I think that we move from the idea of good examples, but to, to systemic transformation. So we're not just looking to individual women who are succeeding in a certain area, um, individual businesses that are doing good things, but we talk about actual systemic transformation and two things we could do I think is if the public services and if all services that are paid for through public procurement if everything we spend public money on came with a requirement and an expectation for decent working conditions a living wage proper leave policies attached that would be one of the largest most transformative things that we could do and it's entirely within the power of the state to do that by next year, if it wished. So that's a really big transformative thing that would make a difference. And the other thing is legislation around um, predictable hour contracts, long term, greater security of contracts, banded hours. We really do need to make sure that the slide towards insecure contracts uh, is addressed. And I think that's something we have to do legislatively. Look, thank you both uh, for your very insightful views and, and opinions today. I've certainly enjoyed uh, the conversation. I think the issue of gender pay is a very, very serious one. And I think if it's not addressed, we'll persist in our society. 
and will be an issue for employers from here on in as well. So thank you both today and uh, thank you for your inputs. Thank, thank you, Sharon. You.